So with that, I'm happy to introduce to some of you and many of you know Dave Walter, our local historian, uh, given us many presentations before on different aspects, different history themes, wonderful uh, informative talk. Today we'll be talking about uh, General Custer. So Dave, with no further ado and uh, elaboration, thanks for uh, being with us again. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Okay. I, I do assume that uh, this audience has some general familiarity with the Civil War and its course, but I also understand that uh, you're not a his Civil War historian group, and I'll try not to get too far down into the, the weeds of, uh, of what's going on in the Civil War. Um, Wayne Zimmerman's not here. And we, we, we don't have a, uh, has an soul of its own. we don't have an organ for him to play well, anyway, but there's a tune I would, I would like to, to find play some. here if I can set it up properly. Why can't I get this to move? Those of us of a certain age can remember sitting in uh, Saturday matinees at the movies, watching a Western. And when that tune came on, it meant the US Cavalry was on the scene. But more specifically, it meant that this man, Major General George Armstrong Custer was on the scene, the leader of the 7th Cavalry. And George Armstrong Custer, known to his family as Aughty, and to his men, uh, his loyal men that beloved him as Old Curly, even though he was 23 years old, uh, is one of those household names in uh, American history where virtually everybody has heard of Eisenhower, Lee, Grant, and General Custer. Uh, there's a handful of people we know about. But our perception of General Custer is, is uh, based on one tragic afternoon for the Custer family. It occurred uh, on June 25th, 1876 on a hill in Southern uh, Montana. And that's what he seems to be remembered for today. When in fact, he should be remembered for another afternoon on July 3rd, 1863 where it can be argued that General Custer saved the United States of America. And I wanna talk about his, his Civil War career today. Uh, and at the end, we'll, we'll mention uh, the other tragic day. Now, you, you've probably, if you watch TV, you've seen movies, he's appeared as a character in hundreds of TV shows and, and different movies. And he's been portrayed differently over the, the decades. Here we see him in uh, They Died With Their Boots On, 1940 movie where Earl Flynn plays General Custer. And he's portrayed there as a, a glorious, heroic American soldier. Then a year later in uh, Santa Fe Trail, uh, Ronald Reagan is playing General or George Custer, and a very fanciful, historically inaccurate movie where, <laughs> where he, he is best buddies with his roommate and West Point classmate, Jeb Stewart, who's played by Earl Flynn. And 
there's a lot of buddy scenes, and of course they vie for the hand of Olivia de Havilland and whatever, and battle John Brown, all of which is totally false. <laughs> but he's the loyal buddy. And here in um, is Gary Cole playing him in uh, Son of the Morning Star. And in that uh, TV production, he's seen as a, a, a glory seeker, a, a publicity hound. And then Richard Mulligan played him in Little Big Man as a genocidal maniac. <laughs> so you have these different views of Custer over the, the years. And there's probably a little bit of truth in, in all of that, but he was a much more complex man. So let's, let's look at his career in the, in the Civil War and uh, his antecedents. He was born December 1839, New Rumley, Ohio, which is a town uh, south of Akron and over towards the Pennsylvania border. And we know he died June 25th, 1876 at 37 years old of gunshot wounds administered by uh, Cheyenne or, or uh, Sioux warriors. He's descended from uh, Paulus Van Haren and Gertrude George Custer, that's Dutch and German ancestry. Uh, on his father's side, and they, they came to Germantown, Pennsylvania in 1684 from the Rhineland. And on my mother's side, I too am descended from Paulus and Gertrude Custer. So once I found that out a couple of years ago, I really wanted to, to <laughs> dig into to him. His parents uh, were Emmanuel and Maria Custer. Uh, he was a blacksmith and a farmer in uh, New Rumley, just barely getting by. And after uh, grammar school, they sent uh, George at age 14 to live with his half si sister in the town of uh, Monroe, Michigan, which is about halfway between Toledo and, and Detroit. Uh, he was educated there in, in a, you want to call it today, a middle school sort of setting. And, uh, it was noted that he was always studying, but he was a bit of a hooligan. His father uh, was a prankster, and he and his, his younger brothers developed that tendency to always be pulling pranks. And one day they, uh, they went in the schoolhouse and they locked the schoolmaster outside, and he had to climb through a window, and you know, then they got punished, that sort of thing. But after he finished uh, in Monroe, Michigan, and at age 15, he went to normal school back in Ohio, and he became a teacher for a year or two. In those days, if you could read or write, and you were 15, 16 years old, you were qualified to teach other people. But he, he uh, aspired to something more in a military career. He persuaded the local congressman to appoint him to uh, the military academy at West Point, and he went off uh, in 1857 as the class of 1862, which was a five-year program in those days. So he goes off to West Point, and one of his accomplishments there is he catches a sexually transmitted disease while on summer break in New York City. And historians believe that this is may, what, may be the reason he never had any children. One of his great friends was a, a man named Tom Rosser, with whom he committed many pranks and delinquencies. And you'll see there, he managed 726 demerits at West Point, which is some sort of a, a, a record. But admittedly, a lot of those demerits were in the last year when it was obvious that war was coming and uh, the attention of the cadets moved a little bit from their studies. He finished last in his class, number 34. Now that's not quite as bad as it sounds because already 55% of those who entered with him had flunked out and another 22 cadets, many of whom ranked lower than him had already resigned and gone south. So the fact that he was last in his class is maybe not as uh, important as some people make it out. And, uh, also, the war had started and the army needed officers badly. So they graduated the class of 62 a year early. And ironically, his worst score in finals was in cavalry tactics. 
<laughs> which is it's funny because in my opinion he became the best uh, cavalry officer in the Union Army. So that, that's one of those strange things. So Custer's luck gets him through West Point and, and uh, it continues. And uh, he ends up in Washington a couple days before the first Battle of Bull Run. And he's picked to send dispatches to General McDowell, who's uh, in charge of the Union Army down towards Bull Run. He carries these dispatches and during the, the battle, uh, he's cited for bravery because he actually helps organize the, the retreat. It was a huge rout and uh, Union soldiers are running everywhere. And Custer actually got cited for helping to stem this, this panic retreat. So this brings him to the attention of, of, of uh, other general officers and he's put on the staff of uh, a general who uh, sends him up in balloons down in uh, the peninsula near uh, Yorktown. And he's, he spots a Confederate withdrawal and he goes out and he does some reconnaissance and he proves to the general that, yeah, the Rebs are pulling back. Then in the Battle of Williamsburg, he's on the staff of General Hancock. And he actually leads a charge and he captures the very first battle flag that the Army of the Potomac captures in the, in the Civil War. Further up the peninsula in, in 1862, he leads a raiding party across the Chickahominy River. And uh, they come to this, this river and nobody knows how deep it is. And he rides his horse in, follow me. And he goes across and they drive the, the Rebs away. Um, Later in the year, after uh, McClellan has been pushed away from Richmond, he's sighted again at South Mountain near Frederick's, uh, or near Frederick, Maryland, where he's sighted for uh, gallantry in pursuit of the, the fleeing rebels. So Custer is always in the right place at the right time, and through his aggressiveness, has come to the attention of some very important people, including General McClellan, who's chief uh, general in the army. Here's a picture of the uh, Professor Lowe's observation balloon that Custer went up in at night and spotted the, the Confederate camps. There's a picture of him um, crossing the Chickahominy <laughs> River. And uh, by his exploits, he, he got the attention of journalists and artists who were embedded with the Union Army all throughout the war. And uh, he was a very um, favorable target for uh, uh, this pictures appearing in Leslie's Illustrated and Harper's and that sort of thing. They were all always looking for a colorful character and he certainly was one. Uh, here's a picture of him after uh, uh, the Battle of Seven Pines where he's, he's friendly with one of his classmates who happens to be a, a rebel. Um, Lieutenant Washington was a collateral descendant of President George Washington. And uh, Custer in many cases ran into former classmates and always treated them with utmost respect and um, I guess you would say chivalry. So after these exploits at um, places like uh, South Mountain and Antietam, um, he goes back to Monroe, his, his half sisters on winter leaves, uh, furloughs. And then 1862, he goes back and he got drunk out of his skull. And his, uh, they dragged him home and his mother put him in the, the parlor and got out the Bible and lectured him for about an hour. And he became a teetotaler. And as far as historians know, he never took another drink in his life. That was one promise he did keep. But anyway, in uh, June of 1863, he's on the staff of General Pleasanton, who's in charge of the Army of the Potomac Cavalry. And uh, the Battle of Brandy Station in, in June of 1863, he's attached to General Buford's uh, division. And he leads an aggressive charge against Rooney Lee's brigade. Uh, 
later in screening the Army of the Potomac as they're chasing Lee up towards Gettysburg, he leaves a charge of the 1st Maine Cavalry after the regimental uh, commander is killed. And he chases uh, the Rebs back towards uh, the Shenandoah. Uh, here is luck really takes a big turn in his favor. He's promoted on June 29th, 1863 to Brigadier General. And at the time he is the youngest Brigadier General uh, in the Union Army serving. He was not the youngest ever, but he's the youngest at that time. He takes over the Michigan Brigade or the Wolverines, uh, which consisted of the 1st, 5th, 6th, and 7th Michigan regiments. One day later, he's in a skirmish in Hanover, Pennsylvania with Jeb Stewart, who's leading a ride completely around the <laughs> Union Army. Um, two days after that, he's at Hunterstown, which is about four miles north of Gettysburg. And he sees a group of rebel cavalry across the stream. And uh, rather impetuously, he gathers about 60 members of uh, one of the Michigan brigades, and he just charges down on them. Little does he know there's 1,200 seasoned rebel <laughs> cavalry under Wade Hampton. And this is the first time he really makes this kind of a reconnaissance mistake. And it may be the last one until little big horn. But uh, suddenly he's in the middle, his horse is shot from under him, uh, uh, another aide pulls him on his horse, saves him, and they go pounding back where he has set up an ambush for the Rebs. Wade Hampton, who's probably the second best uh, rebel cavalry officer, he falls into the trap himself. He rides across and they're ambushed by the, the Michigan Brigade. And um, the rebel army had to pull about 2,000 soldiers, the Stonewall Brigade, out of the lines near Cemetery Hill to deal with this threat that Custer and 60 or 70 men had <coughs> poised. And that played some role, I think, in uh, the Rebs not going up Cemetery Hill on July 2nd. And, and really taking charge of the Battle of Gettysburg. So the next day, he, he and his uh, brigade are placed to secure the right flank on the Hanover Road. Um, but last minute orders keep uh, Pleasanton from moving Custer out of the way. Um, what happens is, well, here's, here's a, let's, let's skip back here. Here's the charge of the First Maine Cavalry. It's by uh, joined by Alfred Ward, who is a famous uh, Civil War illustrator. Um, here, here he is at Hanover in a, a, a painting by Dale Gallant. Uh, he's been a Brigadier General one day. He doesn't have an official uniform. He gets a a, uh, a velvet jacket and a, and a sailor shirt. He puts a big star on it. He's got a red bandana and his, his floppy hat. That becomes his trademark. That red tie is eventually worn by all the members of his cavalry units. But it's flamboyant. That's not what you usually see a, a general wearing. So what are our uh, Stewart's orders at, at Gettysburg? We all know uh, supposedly he was reamed out by General Lee and whatever for not being there for the first two days. But on the, order, the evening of July 2nd, Lee concocts his plan to win the Battle of Gettysburg. And you all know Pickett's Charge and all that where they're going to send 15,000 guys at the center of the Union line. Well, he had detailed Stewart to take 5,000 of his troopers, four brigades of cavalry and 13 cannons to go around the left flank of the Union Army and hit them in the rear just as Pickett's charge arrived at the front. And if that had happened, 
it would have been disaster for General Meade and the Union Army. As he gets about four miles east of Gettysburg, he discovers that he greatly outnumbers the Union cavalry that's sitting down on the Hanover and the low Dutch road. And it's a smaller group, but it has to be swept aside. So this is, there it is. Here, here's the Union fish hook defenses. Everybody's familiar with that if you've studied Gettysburg. Here's where Pickett's charge is going to hit them. Lee has sent Stuart all the way out here. Four brigades of cavalry, 5,000 men. And down here is Custer with about 1,200 men and, and Greg with another 1,200 men. And they're going, Stewart is supposed to sweep down Low Dutch Road, hit the Baltimore Pike, and come riding into the rear of the Union Army as Pickett's charge hits it in the front. And this is where all the uh, supplies are for the Union Army. This is their retreat if they need it. So if, if they get caught in between here, between Stewart and Pickett, the army is going to be split in half and it's going to be a total disaster. Here, here's the, the actual fight at the East Cavalry Field, which I urge you if you're interested in the Battle of Gettysburg to, to uh, visit. But part of the plan is that when Stewart gets in place, Lee tells him to fire a signal gun so I know that you're out there and I can start the Pickett's Charge deal. So Stewart gets up here on Crest Ridge and um, he puts his signal gun and he fires four times, once to the north, once to the east, one to the west, one to the south, to alert Lee. But it also alerts General Gregg down here on Low Dutch and Hanover Road. And that's when he sends a message to the other division, put Custer back here. I need him because something's going to happen. So about one o'clock in the afternoon, Stewart sees Custer and his men down here in the, uh, the corner of, of Low Dutch Road. And they've got to come down this way. So he, he attacks and he brushes aside some of the skirmishers. And Greg tells Custer, take the 7th Michigan, which is about 500 men, and you stop this attack. And there's way in excess of 1,000 men attacking him. <coughs> so the regiment of 500 men suddenly sees the Brigadier General get out in front, pulls his sword, and yells, come on, you Wolverines. And they do a headlong charge right in to the 1,500 men that, that Stewart has sent. Um, Stewart sends reinforcements, and he, he blunts that charge. Custer goes back. He's lost another horse. He goes back, and they, they get the, uh, the first Michigan. And again, he rides out in front, pulls his sword, yells, come on, you Wolverines, and attacks with another 500 men. And one of, it was an observer, <coughs> I, I can quote him here. The observer says, so sudden and violent was the collision that many of the horses were turned to end over end, crushing riders beneath them. Uh, there was 40 minutes of intense fighting. And once the rest of the Union uh, commanders saw that uh, Custer had blunted this attack, they started pulling in some more troops. Uh, New Jersey cavalry and some other units came in. And Stewart was uh, convinced that he wasn't going to push through and attack the rear of the Union lines. And actually, he and his 5,000 men uh, were forced to retreat because of these heroic, courageous, aggressive assaults by George Custer. 
There's the monument out there today on the East Calvary Field. Um, they said he led two charges, uh, each with about 500 men into the advance of, uh, of Stewart, and they suffered 257 casualties, just about the number that he suffered at uh, Little Bighorn. The question is, did he save the day? Well, if he hadn't brushed aside and blunted uh, Stewart's uh, 5,000 men, and they had hit behind uh, Pickett's charge, I believe, and a lot of other historians believe, that it would have been a total disaster for the Union Army, because General Meade had already pulled units out of the line to reinforce where Pickett was, and there would have been nothing except some Teamsters and cooks and bandsmen and hospital attendants that would have been able to stop Stewart from crashing into the back of the Union line at, at just the, the wrong time. Well, if he was so heroic, why didn't he get a Medal of Honor? And it's probably a travesty that he didn't. But by the time most of the Medals of Honor were given out, um, Custer was already dead. The army was uh, <clears throat> somewhat embarrassed and ashamed of what happened out there in, in Montana. And other heroes like uh, Colonel Galusha Pennypacker from Westchester, he got his Medal of Honor in 1891. Um, he led the assault on Fort Fisher. Uh, Joshua Chamberlain, who's uh, also regarded as one of the heroes of Gettysburg, he didn't get his Medal of Honor until 1893. So by the time they were giving out Medals of Honors for things other than capturing flags, Custer had already been dead 15 years or so, and um, he did not get a Medal of Honor, which I think he certainly richly deserved. So right after Gettysburg, uh, Custer keeps on making news, getting publicity. He attacks the Confederate rear guard at a town called Falling Waters. On July 14th, he captures 1,200 prisoners from Lee's rear guard and his uh, Michigan boys kill uh, General Pettigrew. Later in 1863, he actually saves a day for Kilpatrick, who was his uh, division uh, boss there. Uh, Kilpatrick is advancing and um, Custer is, is further back here in, in the column. And he's told to, hey, you know, pick it up. You're falling behind. But Custer intuitively thought there was there was something something wrong. And uh, and this happened all throughout his career and until the end, where he sees over here there's a woods, and he just knows something's not right with the situation. So he takes part of his brigade and he sends them off towards the woods and Fitz Lee is hiding there with his 1500 troopers. And um, by Custer doing this, he starts a fight going on. Kilpatrick comes back and they're not ambushed after the whole column is, uh, you know, gone past. And, and that's just one of uh, Custer's uh, reconnaissance and his intuitive uh, understanding of the tactics of the enemy. Uh, the Union is driven from the field, but they avoid annihilation there at uh, the Battle of Buckland Mills. So as I said on his, his winter furloughs, he was going back to uh, Monroe, Michigan, it was half sisters. And in 1862, he meets uh, Elizabeth Libby Cliff Bacon, the girl he didn't leave behind, and they fall in love pretty quickly. Uh, she was born in 1842, and she's doted on by her father, who is a wealthy judge and a former state uh, representative. She's smart. She graduated head of the class from her girl's seminary. Uh, and they fall in love from their first meeting, but 
uh, George Bacon is is opposed, um, even though the the Bacons and the the Custer half sister, and then later the Custers live on the same street in Monroe. There's a class difference. I mean, George's father's a blacksmith and a farmer that's barely getting by. The Bacons are rich, uh, wealthy. Worst of all, uh, the Custers are Democrats and they're Methodists. And the Bacons are Republicans and Presbyterians. And they did not get along. However, George gets promoted to Brigadier General, and suddenly he's more acceptable as a, a son-in-law. So George and uh, Libby are married in the sanctuary of the First Presbyterian Church in Monroe, Michigan in February of 1864. There's a picture of them as newlyweds, and George didn't leave her behind. Um, like most officers had to. He actually, through his whole career, he brought Libby with him um, to be close to his posting. And on their, their honeymoon, they went from Michigan to uh, Buffalo, and uh, they went to West Point in New York. And on the train from New York to Washington, when he was uh, reporting back, they actually ran into General U.S. Grant, who was coming to Washington at Lincoln's insistence to take over the, uh, the Union Army. And uh, she soon went out to, to uh, live near the, his winter camp at uh, Brandy Station. And she was there at Fort Abraham Lincoln at, at the end. So we, we jump now to May of 1864, where uh, General Phil Sheridan convinces General Grant that the cavalry is not being used properly. It, it should be more aggressive and take the fight to the uh, to the Rebs. So he persuades Grant to let him take 10,000 troopers and set out on a raid towards Richmond. Uh, very next day, Custer's brigade takes Beaver Dam Station and frees 400 Union prisoners, captures several train loads of of supplies and that sort of thing. And then uh, the next day, there's a big battle at the town called Yellow Tavern, which is five miles north of Richmond. That's how far they penetrated. And during that battle, uh, one of the fish, fifth Michigan troopers uh, shoots and kills uh, the Southerners, Bo Saber, Jeb Stewart. Here's a, just a quick map of Yellow Tavern. Um, Stewart managed to, with, he has about 5,000 troopers. He managed to get in front of Sheridan's uh, 10,000 at one point. And uh, the Union Cavalry is ordered to attack him. You can see here Custer's Brigade smashes through here right where, where Stewart is. And in the, the melee, uh, one of the 5th Michigan troopers is dismounted and he's running along the ground and he, suddenly there's Jeb Stewart on his horse and he takes his revolver and shoots him. And Stewart uh, died uh, a day later in, in uh, Richmond. Um, the battle was famous. Here's Frank Leslie's Illustrated showing the battle with the steward. Uh, when the cavalry got into it, they got hand to hand, horse to horse, and you were clashing swords and pointing revolvers at each other from inches away. So later in uh, 1864, um, Grant has surrounded uh, Richmond and Petersburg, and he, he tells General Sheridan to take 50,000 soldiers and go up in the Shenandoah Valley and once and for all uh, end the rebel control of the Shenandoah and uh, destroy the granary of Lee's army. So again, Custer's brigade is uh, assigned to Sheridan. They become pretty good buddies. 
And he skillfully defeats the Reb Cavalry at, at almost every turn in his, in his uh, skirmishes. He divides his regiment into battalions and he'll have one holding the action here and he'll send the other battalion around the back and it works beautifully. He, they push the Rebs all the way down the, the Shenandoah Valley and he's, he, it's very good at this. And uh, thinking ahead, this is what he does at Little Bighorn, not so successfully. By now, he is a Northern hero, just like Jeb Stewart was the, um, the Cavalier of the South. By this time, Custer and his exploits are all over the papers, all over the illustrated things in the North. Um, becomes one of the most famous uh, soldiers in, in the Civil War. And some of it may go to his head, but he doesn't really seek that out. He's, he loves war. He loves um, his aggressive tactics. He loves beating the Rebs. And he's not really doing it for uh, press coverage. We move to the Battle of Winchester, where uh, Custer's brigade actually breaks the Confederate left flank at a very critical time. And because of that exploit, he's given command of the 3rd Cavalry Division. He's bre breveted Major General. Uh, and he is, uh, at that time, the youngest Major General ever in the uh, American Army. And one of the battles leading up to uh, Winchester was a battle at a place called Tom's Brook. And guess who his opponent is leading the Rebel Cavalry? his old friend and classmate, Tom Rosser. And it, it's well known and recorded that as they watched each other before the battle, Custer ran, rides to the front in between the lines, takes his hat off and bows to his old friend, Tom Rosser. And then of course they go at it. <laughs> but it, it shows, you know, the gallantry and the, it's, the war is still somewhat civilized. And there's the Battle of Tom's Brook where uh, the Confederates are down here. Custer attacks with his division here, but he always sends a brigade around the flank and he hits the Rebs on, on the flank. So again, we see Custer <laughs> very successful at dividing his forces and putting them into action at just the right time. We come to the Battle of Cedar Creek, Virginia, which um, was, was quite an affair. Uh, Jubal Early, the commander of the, the Reb Army, uh, sneaks up on the Union Army and uh, drives them for several miles. And Custer is back here on the right flank of the Union Army. And as the panicked retreat comes up the road, Custer puts his brigade and his band on the road and they start playing Yankee Doodle, which was the favorite tune of, of, the, uh, of his band. And he actually stems the retreat uh, long enough for Phil Sheridan to return to the battlefield organize an attack. And at uh, 4 p.m., the Union Army counterattacks. And again, Custer comes around the flank, drives into the, uh, the flank of the rebel army and they panic and, and they run. Okay, uh, along about this time, uh, Libby Custer has a flag made out of silk and she presents it to him for his headquarters flag. And he carries this for the rest of his career. Um, thankfully, we can see it today because when he left for the Little Bighorn, they left the flag behind at uh, Fort Abraham Lincoln. So we still have it today. And Custer also did another thing. There was not many awards given out during the Civil War, other than the Medal of Honor. 
And he actually designed a, his own Custer badge, which he gave to his subordinates who had distinguished themselves. He had these made at, uh, at Tiffany in New York, and they cost uh, $27, which is equivalent or five or $600 today. And he bought these out of his own pocket. Um, and uh, this is one that was awarded to uh, James Kidd and it has Custer's name on it. And down here it says Tubor. And I looked that up and it means I will defend, which is Michigan State Mata. We don't know how many of these were given out, but it did come out of his own pocket at a time when he was making about $315 a month as a, as a general. So a $27 uh, gold badge um, set him back a, a few bucks. The war ends, of course, with a one week retreat where Lee has to abandon Richmond. And in, the, in that week, it takes about 100 miles. And uh, Custer's uh, division is in pursuit the whole time. And he's out in front of the Union Army. Um, and they're always trying to get in, in front of, of Lee and stop him. Uh, one of the major battles where one fifth of Lee's army is, is captured is at Sailor's Creek. And here you can see uh, the Reb rear guard is, is in two places here. Custer sees there's a gap and he sends his cavalry into this gap. He splits the two Reb armies, they retreat, but he, they take about 8,000 prisoners. Again, Custer is instrumental in a, in a major victory. Then we arrive at Appomattox Courthouse. And as I said, Custer is out in the, the lead of the pursuit. He blocks uh, the roads west at Appomattox Station. They capture three Confederate trains that are waiting at the station with 300,000 rations for Lee's army, which is, is starving at this point. They have ammunition, but they don't have food. And Custer has burned the trains and captured them, and he's sitting there waiting. And uh, Custer actually receives the first flag of truce from the rebels. And uh, the, the truce carrier is ushered to uh, Grant, of course. But Custer rides into the rebel camp up to General Longstreet, who's second in command. and. He demands that Longstreet surrender to him. And of course, Longstreet, you know, get away, little, little man. Um, only General Lee can, can do this. And he's off to see Grant right now. So Custer's there at first pool run. He's there at Appomattox. And there's the table on which uh, General Grant wrote the surrender terms. And immediately after the... Uh, surrender ceremony, General Sheridan goes over to Mr. McLean who owns the house and he gives him 20 bucks in gold to buy the table that uh, the surrender was written on. And he donates the table to Libby Custer, writing to her that there is scarcely an individual in our service who has contributed more to bring this about than your gallant husband. Libby had that displayed at the Smithsonian, uh, and it became their property on her death in April of 1933. She lived 57 years as a widow, unmarried, after George's death. So let's, at this point, the war is over. Uh, Custer participates in the uh, Grand Review on May 23rd, 1865 in Washington. He leads his, his division, lots of cheers, this sort of thing. And he's riding a thoroughbred prize-winning horse that he is named Don Juan, that he has stolen <laughs> a month after the surrender from a farmer in Virginia. He rides this horse. He's eventually told to give it back, but 
and it's worth $10,000. And he's thinking he's going to sell that horse, get that 10,000, which is equivalent of 300,000 today. And that's going to be his nest egg for his future. The horse dies. <laughs> but, but Custer goes to, to New York and he starts hobnobbing with what's called the silk stocking Democrats, Vanderbilt's, uh, Astor's, these sort of people. And um, they actually urge him to run for Congress in, uh, in, in Michigan. And he's what, 26 years old? He's not ready for politics. So he turns down this chance to run for Congress. And he becomes, uh, well, Grant appoints him head of the new 7th US Cavalry with an army rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Um, he's a stern taskmaster. And the cavalry after the Civil War was not the cavalry during the Civil War. Uh, those men and before were volunteers, they were patriotic, they were uh, committed to the cause. After the war, the cavalry was totally different. And this was proven to me because my wife, Laura's great grandfather was in the third US cavalry uh, at the same time that Custer was building the seventh US cavalry. And I've actually reviewed the uh, monthly muster records of the Third Cavalry. And what struck me is every month there were 25 new recruits and there were 25 desertions. So in a year's time, a regiment would, would lose a third of its men to desertion. And what was happening was um, unemployed people and petty criminals and whatever on the, in the East were going west on the army's dime. They would enlist, they would get a free ride out to the plains, and then they would desert and head off to the gold diggings and that sort of thing. So Custer was uh, faced with all sorts of raw and unruly troops. And um, he, he was a stern disciplinarian. He had many of them whipped. Uh, and he also antagonized the subordinate officers such as Reno and Benteen after the Washita massacre where Custer left behind a couple of wounded fellow officers and that didn't uh, sit well. So by 1876, Custer is pursuing glory and he's considering a run for president of the United States as a Democrat in 1880. And Unfortunately, he's, uh, he comes to Washington in April of 1876, and he uh, testifies before Congress in the Belknap scandal, which uh, Belknap was Secretary of War, and he was involved with Orville Grant, President Grant's brother. And uh, Custer and others exposed Belknap for his treatment of the Indians, where they were uh, jipping the heck out of the Indians at the trading post and putting money in their pocket. So to some extent, Custer is, is sympathetic to the Indians. Well, this didn't sit well with President Grant, and uh, he makes sure that Custer does not lead his expedition into the Black Hills to, to punish the Sioux and the Cheyenne. There's a famous, uh, one of dozens of famous pictures of what people think Custer's last stand looked like. Uh, this is what happens when uh, your scouts can't count uh, and you don't know how many, how many people or how many enemies are living in each teepee. You've never seen the terrain before and you overestimate your ability to militarily intimidate your foe. And in many cases, the Cheyenne and Sioux Indians were better armed than the 7th Cavalry, which the U.S. government had sent, sold most of the modern weapons to other countries. Question, where are Custer's bones? Well, a couple days after the massacre at uh, Little Bighorn, where about a third of the 7th Cavalry was wiped out. 
people think it was the whole regiment, but it wasn't. Um, they went and they hastily buried all the soldiers. And there was a detailed explanation of how they laid out Custer in a certain blanket and this sort of thing. So when they go back a year or so later to formally inter these bones, they take what they believe to be Custer's bones and they move them eventually to West Point where his supposed grave is. Uh, historians today, based on the description of the, of the bones that were found, believe that it was not Custer. So Custer probably still lays with his men on that hilltop above the Little Bighorn River. The Seventh Cavalry does not exist today. Um, that's their coat of arms there with a drawn saber. The Phoenix rising from the ashes because it did come back after the Battle of Little Bighorn. A head of a Plains Indian warrior, a prairie flower, and seven horseshoes turned up for good luck. <laughs> um, the seventh, as I said, doesn't exist, but there are uh, a number of uh, reconnaissance battalions in the U.S. Army today whose antecedents go back to the Seventh Cavalry, and th that's the the patch that they uh, they wear, the Gary Owen patch. That's my story of Custer and his Civil War exploits and uh, the heroics that may have saved the Union at Gettysburg. And uh, questions or comments from the audience. Sir. Yes, the uh, before Little Big Court, Custer uh, wiped out a peaceful village at Washington. Right, 1869. Totally unprovoked. It was led by black cattle. And uh, they were at peace with the army. So I, I have an ethical dilemma with Custer. He was colorful and uh, brave in the Civil War, but he also murdered uh, a peaceful Indian. That's true. And, uh, you know, it was, it was swept under the rug because a lot of uh, people at the time believed the only good Indian was a dead Indian, whether they were peaceful or not. Um, I haven't visited the Washington battlefield, uh, but uh, I understand there's uh, monuments there now that explain what you just said, that it was not a heroic action by the U.S. Cavalry by any means. Um, he wasn't pro-Indian. He wasn't particularly anti-Indian. He was neutral on the slavery question. So he's a, a complex person like most of figures in American history. Another? Yeah, um, cavalry is horses. So are all, and I, I, I don't have anybody that I know in the army, um, are all the cavalry's gone or do some units still carry that name? And why did the seventh cavalry cavalry just dissolve? Uh, well, there's obviously no horse cavalry today. The uh, third cavalry that Laura's great grandfather in still exists. It's third armored cavalry now. They use my nephews uh, in the cavalry, <laughs> and they still have the same the same motto they had from yeah. 1860 of the brave rifles. So they still exist. Uh, the seventh, I believe, was dissolved after World War One, and the units, the regiments, and the divisions, and everything in the U.S. Army are much much larger than they were back in uh, the Civil War. But uh, the seventh exists today as re reconnaissance battalions for infantry divisions. So they're still doing the reconnaissance that they would have done back in the Civil War. In Vietnam also, there was the first air cavalry and their uh, horses were helicopters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did, the horse, did the helicopters have uh, horse names. And there was the Apache, uh, and there were. It was in a different division, but uh, <laughs> and I don't remember if they had a sword on their patch. 
So armored cavalry is still used. Their third armored is headquartered in Fort Hood, Texas. And yeah, yes, sir. Just the World War II combat. Uh, between World War I and World War II, a cavalry officer named George Pack decided that they ought to ride tanks instead of right. horses. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Pat and Patton and uh, Eisenhower had a tank school at, at Gettysburg during World War I, where they started to uh, develop tanks for the U.S. Army. Any others? The word cavalry is derived from the word horse, the French word for horse, but it, the actual, it's come to mean mobile uh, unit right. of any kind. What's the French word? Cheval. Cheval and there's cavalero with the Spanish horsemen. Okay, any others? Interesting. Uh, just an aside commonly considered that the autobiography by Ulysses S. Grant is the finest presidential autobiography we've ever had. And uh, he was encouraged by Mark Twain to write his biography mm -hmm. because he was dying of cancer. And he was basically penniless. He was trying to raise funds for his family. Yeah, his, his brother managed to uh, bankrupt him. Um, we visited Grant's cottage up in the Adirondacks last year where he finished that uh, uh, memoir just a couple weeks before his death. And, uh, you know, you think of him as some uneducated person, but the writing in there is beautiful. And he wrote it himself, whereas presidents today have a ghostwriter write their book. But uh, his wife, Libby, who never married afterwards, she wrote a book, uh, My Life on the Plains, and uh, it, it uh, perpetuated the, the Custer glory myth. And she was, uh, for the next 50 some years, his best uh, uh, spokesman. And Custer himself wrote a, no, he wrote My Life on the Plains. I think she wrote something about tenning on the plains. So, um, but yes, if you want to read a good memoir, read U.S. Grant's memoirs. This is from a military side. I was, uh, you talked about Custer, how he always used the flanking uh, movement. After Jeb Stewart, I mean, did the, did the South not have the same number of cavalry, or why didn't they use that tactic since it was used so effectively against them? Well, they did try it, but they did not have the man and materials the horse flesh had deteriorated the uh, they didn't have the forage to uh, keep the horses in good condition and uh, they were they were overwhelmed and they did not have the you know when your best leaders keep getting killed or wounded you suddenly are scraping the bottom of the barrel and uh, Fitz Lee and Rooney Lee and Rosser and people like that did not have the skills to uh, to combat it, but you can see uh, you know the battle of Little Bighorn. Custer divided the seventh into three groups, and Reno and Benteen were to attack the village, and he was going to go around the back and whatever. And that had worked so many times successfully in the Civil War, but uh, he was outnumbered and outgeneraled by crazy horse. Sir, yeah, I I thought there was a uh, the military had still had one horse unit that was used that is used for like funerals, the horse drawn carriages. Yeah, they probably have something in, in Washington attached to the uh, the uh, old guard at uh, Arlington that yeah, does say, that sort of thing. One of the guys I worked with out at Boeing was uh, in Vietnam, and yeah. he passed away. And I went to his uh, funeral in but Arlington. They, they anyway. certainly don't train with uh, sabers and pistols and carbines for no. combat. But, the, but his, his casket was drawn by a horse. Yeah. I'm sure there is. And all that trillion dollar budget, there's got to be a couple of 
courses in there somewhere. <laughs> well, we thank you and uh, we'll see. Thank you, Dave. I'm planning, uh, I'm planning to do something on, on Lewis and Clark as a whole. That's a topic that people will be interested in. Well, we look forward to uh, next fall's presentation. Sure.